Welcome to this week's episode of Food Bikes. We have a special guest here today. You know her from just a couple of weeks ago. But the subject of today's episode is going to be about food waste. And, and it's really important. I know lots of us uh, are aware of it and what's going on. But around the world, 1.3 billion pounds of food is wasted every year. And, you know, it's enough to, if just a quarter of that was saved, it would be enough to, to feed 187 million people. Um, so there, there are consequences to it. It's not just that food is wasted. It ends up being that many people who could really need it do not get connected to that. And, and I think that's really important in Canada too. And I'm sure our guests will take us through that. But, you know, in, in Canada, we're going through all sorts of different things where, um, you know, millions of Canadians are just disposing of food because they can, uh, because it's readily accessible. Um, you know, for Canadian families too, this is a real issue. For food banks, they've been facing it a lot. And if you remember two weeks ago, we were so lucky to get Kathy Lennon here. Now, Kathy is on the uh, on the board of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, which I found fascinating. I'm sure that gives her a different kind of perspective on things, a good perspective. But she's also the general manager of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, who we love as a food bank, and food banks in general do, because we do so much work with the OFA at, at different levels to make sure that, that people get to food that needs to get to where it needs to go to that need it. Kathy, I really appreciate you joining us today. I do. It means a lot to us. Thank you very much for having me again. I enjoyed our last conversation. It was a wide-ranging conversation, right? But at the very end of it, I was looking at it last night, at the very end of it, you said, you know what, we could discuss <laughs> um, um, food waste. And I realized I'd probably talk way too much in it and didn't let you get to that. So this <laughs> program is going to be all yours, Kathy. I think, I think it would be good to really talk about uh, food waste from the perspective that you have. You see it from so many different angles. I only see it from one or two. So... Um, why don't you just kind of give us, can you do this? Give us just a general introduction as to food waste in Canada and also how serious is it? And then maybe we can get to talking about what are some of the things we can do either individually, uh, community-wise, but also in public policy that might be able to change some of that. Sure. Well, I think uh, one of the things that is certainly um, surprising to many is the uh, is the figures. I think you shared a few figures earlier, but 35 million uh, metric tons of uh, food waste is produced here in Canada annually. And uh, that when they talk about food waste, that isn't actually just food. It also includes packaging um, right. that we that we purchase and bring home, and then have to you know find a way to compost or recycle or or throw it away um, into a, a garbage bag. But food waste is definitely something that happens all the way through the system, uh, from the farm level uh, to the retail store, processors, grocery stores, and even restaurants. And so there there are places to get involved all. All the way through that chain to try to tackle some of those issues. How do you folks look at it? Has it become more of an issue to the chamber than it used to be? Yeah, so actually I haven't seen um, food waste, uh, particularly on the agenda of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, but uh, one of the things that they do talk about is sustainability of businesses and trying to find ways to ensure that the entire um, business chain is successful and productive and looking at ways to minimize all kinds of waste um, through the system and improve profitability and sustainability of businesses all the way through the system. And that's like tourism and, uh, and food processing and manufacturing. Um, and even most recently, the chamber came out with a report around um, procurement and how to make sure that we are procuring things in a sustainable manner. So yes, it might make sense to buy 300 computers uh, if you get a better purchase rate on yeah. them. But if it takes so long to use those computers in your system that by the time you sort of get to the end, they're irrelevant or redundant, then did you really save any money? Yeah. Um, so we've got to look at all of those pieces. We came up against this uh, just uh, four or five years ago. I was meeting with city officials here in London. And the person who is in charge of the Climate Emergency Action Plan uh, for the city um, was talking to me about how they were running into trouble because the landfills were getting filled. 
on, on the perimeter of London and uh, didn't know quite what to do with it. So we, we talked about what is primarily going in there that's causing all the difficulties and it was food and it was primarily fresh food and as you said, packaging as well, mm -hmm. right? And and they wondered how to divert that, that they, you know, they've been looking at it and they weren't sure. So at the meeting, I had suggested that we as a food bank could take that food and uh, get it to the food bank and then distribute it through all the different agencies that we assist each day, but also through the, you know, the 6,000 families that we feed each month. And it, it was really interesting what happened to that discussion. I mean, within 10, 15 minutes, uh, the grocery store folks said, look, it, that would be great for us because we have to pay, you know, for disposing of that stuff in the landfill. The city folks in charge of the waste management were very much about, yeah, that might really solve a problem for us, which is all of the food that's going into the landfill. So I asked the grocery stores if they would be willing to give, make the food available earlier. Is there some way that they could look at and know what was going to be surplus and be able to get it so the food bank could still get it when it was fresh? They said yes, they felt that they could do that. And then there's a group called Business Cares in London, which is made up of about 500, 600 businesses. They meet each or they work each year to just, you know, get food for the food bank. And they give over a million dollars, a million pounds worth of food every year to what the food bank is doing. They said, look, we'll pay for the trucks. So we'll pay for the transport of all of these things. And within six weeks, it was working like a top. Like it was just, we were all kind of shocked I think the staff and volunteers at the food bank were a little bit surprised that it, it worked out so well, right? Because they were suddenly inundated with all of this food. and we. Had, but fortunately, we were able to move it out quickly. But I, I guess what I'm saying is it's something that's often seen as a problem in, in those senses and we have to address it. Through collaboration can sometimes find ways through that really quickly. And that's what happened in London. So, you know, over the course of that four years since we started, it's been over 4 million pounds of food that's come in through the London Food Bank. And that's allowed us as a food bank to suddenly get up to close to 55% of the food that we give out is fresh, right? It's obviously helped the other agencies that we're feeding. And, and lots of congratulations come to the food bank for us setting up, we call it community refresh. But it actually was hardly us at all. It was these collaborative partners who had come together, including the city, who decided they were they would do that. I presume you probably have seen a lot of that throughout the province, have you? Yeah, there's a little bit uh, of that kind of partnership definitely happens on the farm as well, particularly with uh, fresh food um, that might have been destined for processing, for example, like uh, sweet corn or uh, uh, peas and beans that might have been destined to a food processor as opposed to a um, you know, a, a fresh market or a farmer's market. So if they see that they are at the end of the business needs for product, like we were talking earlier about, you know, overproducing, there are times when the farmers are able to identify, okay, I have met my contract obligations for my sweet corn or my beans, and yet I still have a really good crop here um, that is available for consumption. And so there's a number of organizations across the province. Um, mm -hmm. They're known as gleaners. And, uh, and they'll come out and uh, glean the last of the, uh, of the produce from the field and take it back. And there are tremendous groups of volunteers who wash and cut and pack. And, uh, and it might be canned or it might be dry. Some of those goods make them into uh, um, packaged bean um, bags for soups and those sorts of things. So away, there's a lot of farmers that, uh, you know, they've put their heart and soul into producing the crop. And there's nothing that they want more than to see it enjoyed on on tables, whether it's in Ontario, Canada, and in some cases around the world, um, they're producing a food and, and that's where they want to see it. So similar must, to what you've done with the grocery stores. Yeah. It must be hard for the, the grower or the producer because you can't grow exactly what you're going to be able to sell because you have no idea what the market is going to do, the fluctuations of it, the geographic challenges of it all. Um, so I, I presume, uh, you know, for the growers and producers that we have talked to and that we work with as a food bank a lot, they actually spend a lot of time trying to maximize how they can do that. 
as opposed to just planting and then harvesting and then whatever is left over the gift of food bank. They actually are trying to find a way to, you know, uh, limit that wastage or whatever it is. They're also trying to cut costs. But at the end of the at the end of the day, they still have to be able to grow enough to be able to meet market demand. Is that a tricky calculation? And and how much does the market change year upon year that makes those kind of judgments difficult? Yeah. Um, so we are so lucky in a province like Ontario where we grow and produce so many things. Those questions are always incredibly complex, right? It depends yeah, on exactly. if you uh, have a dairy farm um, or a hog farm or an asparagus farm, right? Because even on the livestock side, it can be very difficult uh, to predict with a tremendous amount of accuracy uh, what your production might yeah. be at the end of the day. So there's a lot of things you can, you can control. Um, you can control the amount of uh, feed that you put in front of your livestock every day, and you can control the amount of water that you put in front of them. You can maybe even control to some degree um, the heating or cooling in your barn, but there's lots of things that are out of your control um, that really contribute to, to the growth and the production. So it could, it could be weather. Um, it could be, you know, when they're, when cows are feeling really hot, maybe they don't feel like eating quite as much. And so maybe that impacts their production. And of course, with crops as well, um, you know, we never know, is it going to be a wet spring or a dry spring yeah. or is it going to are we going to have a really hot August or, in, you know, in this case, a really hot September. And so that really significantly impacts production. So farmers often work in averages and they have a really good idea of what a typical year um, with typical conditions would produce. And then they plan around that as best as they can to try to figure out, um, you know, what will the soil produce? What will these animals produce and, and try to shoot for those uh, markets and uh, and things change, right? You might have a, uh, a time of year where there's a tremendous promotion on peaches, for instance, and and all of the consumers say, gosh, I saw this really great ad or a really great movie and I'm going to go. And, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you've got a big peak of demand for peaches uh, that, that you may not have had at the same week at the same time the previous year. So consumers yeah. are a fickle bunch to plan around. Yeah. Um, sandwiched in between um, uh, your two shows that we've done uh, from a couple of weeks ago today, we had an, uh, somebody else this last week who was a speaker with you at Brescia, which is okay. how I first made that contact. She's a farmer, and she's a farmer from just outside of London. And, and she said something that I really zeroed in on. She said it that night at Brescia, but I, I just found it so interesting. She said, look at... Um, my parents are farmers. One of the commercials that I was voice dubbing over, as you know, it had her father in it. Uh, so that was really great. But she says, we think in generations. And I thought, what? And it made such total sense, right? And, and like I was a firefighter for almost 30 years. And then you end and your career is over. You know, I, you know, we do other things in our lives and, and that's it. And then you move on to the next but people who grow and people who produce, uh, they, they've been in it for a long time and, and there's those, those resources are handed on to family and it keeps going forward and, and more and more. But that idea of thinking in generations that growers and producers have to do, that doesn't seem to jive very well with a market that always is trying to do different things every day, changing everything all around, the advertising and everything. And it must be hard, I would presume, for growers and producers, livestock managers and others, not just predicting the market and where that's going to be, but trends that come along or things like environmental policies that, that suddenly happen, right? I, it, it seems to me that even the development of food banks, which happened, you know, 40 years ago um, in my old province of Alberta, you know, they the farmers there really got behind food banks and, and saw this as an opportunity for them to be able to give some of their surplus. And um, but it must be hard to think generation generationally in a world, especially of consumers that are always looking for different things every month. Uh, how big a problem is that? Is it actually getting better? Uh, or is it the kind of thing that, that gets just more confounding for growers and producers that are trying to think in the long term? Tough question. Yeah. I know. It, is a, it is a big question, but uh, I think it's it's an exciting one. And, and I'm a big proponent of that statement too. farmers think in generations, unlike 
any other uh, profession that I've ever run across. Um, you know, they've often inherited a farm from a previous generation and they are thinking ahead to their children and their grandchildren running this farm. But I think one of the things that's, that's always also true is that farmers are great innovators um, and they are paying attention to markets and they are paying attention to consumer trends and they're, they're anxious to go to conferences and, and look around the world and see, you know, what's coming next and what are, what are people looking for and is it organic produce or is it, um, you know, naturally grown product or is it a new vegetable uh, that we haven't seen or a new fruit that we haven't seen in this country historically uh, due to immigration. And, and you look north of Toronto and there's tremendous examples of very small farms actually that are growing ethnic vegetables for uh, markets that, you know, 10, 15, yeah. 20 years ago uh, weren't so obvious and apparent. And I think down in the Windsor area too, there's great examples of small farms that are growing unique uh, products for, for those growing markets. And I know when I look back to working at the Ontario Sheep Marketing Agency, um, that was something that we were looking at too, even back, you know, a, a great number of years about, ago about let's look at immigration. Who is coming to live in Canada um, and settle their families here and, and grow here? And what sort of things are they looking for on their menu? And we saw that as a tremendous opportunity for the sheep industry in that a lot of cultures that are moving and establishing themselves here have uh, lamb, not as a unique special meal, which which might be what often yeah. historically Canadians saw lamb as, you know, a, a special Easter dinner. You've got um, a market that potentially is growing because there is a community where lamb is an everyday meat and something that they'd be looking to incorporate in, into one or two or three meals a week. So I, I love to see that farmers are looking at those things and trying to say, okay, this is a sector where there's a lot of opportunity uh, for growth and how do we meet those needs? And, you know, is it restaurants? Is it recipe development? Is it, you know, looking at uh, marketing in different kinds of grocery stores or farmers markets that cater to a special population? So let's think of the complexity for that of that for a minute. Um, you know, I was an MP in Ottawa for a number of years, as you know, and, you know, I was <clears throat> on a number of committees and some of them which discuss food. But just in this last two months, two major party leaders in Ottawa have talked about over the Thanksgiving period that it was really, uh, you know, if we really want to take care of food insecurity and feed needy families, give to a food bank, volunteer, do everything you can to help with that. And for those of us as food bank directors who are on a conference call the next Monday, we just kind of went, ah, right? It's the last thing we actually want to, want to take place. I think that the generosity of Canadians is wonderful and, and growers, producers, companies, it's all really, really fantastic. On the other hand, we are watching as, let's say in, in London, for instance, 6,000 families a month we're trying to assist. That's up 91% in two years. But if we keep telling people that the way that we deal with that is to give to food banks, it's actually digging the hole deeper in my mind. I mean, really what you want to be doing is saying, let's make food affordable for everybody. So don't focus all your efforts on just helping people of low income and set it up in a charitable model, set it up in a market model where people, you know, growers, producers can bring their products into a city, you know, kind of saturate a city so that there's or a community and so that there's competition and prices begin to lower, right? But it it, it seems to me that that's a, a very difficult thing to do when you're living in a country that's got a lot of money. I mean, our, our wealthiest year was 2019. You and I talked about this the last time, right? So how can you make so much money and yet not feed your own people? You know, how can you build so many homes and yet not house the homeless? So it's it's a real issue, I, I think. Um, but I guess my question to you, sorry, I'm rambling there. But my question to you is, how can we tighten that up? Like, it seems to me, I, I used to think if we could just get people to do food security, we'll switch over to that and get it done. But actually what's happening in the system is both are running at the same time. So you're seeing uh, greenhouses and food containers and things like that all happening at the same time that, that uh, food banks are really, really growing. It's like we can't get to the core of this problem, which is really 
allow the growers and producers easy access to markets, bring the cost of food down, give accessible food to everybody, and that would largely solve the problem that we're facing. Why do we have so much trouble getting to that? I guess one of the things that I might push back on is, um, do we really need to bring the cost of food down? Or do we need to assist in getting folks to a place Income. where they have a living wage That's right. uh, that yeah. they can support themselves and their families uh, with what it takes in order to live in a safe uh, shelter and purchase, um, you know, purchase safe and nutritious food um, to support themselves and their family. So um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I think in in general we have a pretty affordable. Uh, food supply here in Canada. Um, and uh, there's a lot of risk involved in growing food. And I'm not, I'm not really confident there's a lot of opportunity to drive costs down. At different times, for sure, you know, you can, you can point to times when a particular uh, commodity is overpriced in the marketplace due to maybe supply and demand. But generally speaking, I'd love to see the conversation looking at how do we support people um, to get the um, the income levels that are required to sustain themselves and their families. Yes, and uh, I would agree with that. And you're not the first person person to push back at me on that one. I think it's a great subject to discuss and to debate. On the yeah. other hand, I'm sure that many of the folks who are watching this this program are going to be saying, do you know how much I'm paying for groceries right now? Like that's what they're going to say. And if yeah. you're going to say it's an income issue, that could be true. I mean, that's definitely a, an important component of it. On the other hand, it seems like the prices of food are, are, are fairly exorbitant in the average person's mind is what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah. I, I understand about the income uh, piece. We definitely see that when it comes to things like wages, people on minimum wage, they can't even afford rent at the moment. So all of that stuff is very true. On the other hand, there has to be this part, uh, I would suppose to the industry, like I see the prime minister's, prime ministers called the grocery stores back to Ottawa this week because he wants to have a follow-up discussion of what's happening, like why are your grocery prices so high? So I do, you know, I hear exactly what you're saying and I agree and, and the food banks of Ontario are all fighting that it's actually an income issue. And, and I really agree with that. But I do think for average Canadians, they're kind of lost as to why is it suddenly that groceries seem out of reach? Is it because they don't make enough because many of them are comfortable middle-class folks but are alarmed at the price of food going up? Do you have a thought on that? Am I off on that? No, you're definitely right. There are, there are products that are out of reach uh, or have become more expensive, particularly in the last you know, 12 or 18 months. Food inflation is a real thing. Um, there's no doubt about that. And whether it's meat products or, or vegetables or, or yeah. breads, it's affecting all the way through the system. And I think there's a lot of pieces there. Um, and there's been a couple of universities, I think the University of Calgary and the University of Guelph have both tried to dig into that a little bit to say, what is driving this food inflation? Is it carbon tax? Is it transportation? Is it labor? Is it supply chain disruption? And of course, it's all of those things. Yeah. Um, there's been so much pressure on the food system, some of it driven um, throughout COVID um, and, and beyond. And we've seen some, some real interruption in things like logistics and distribution and yeah, gas sure. prices and, and labor. And you know, I, I know everyone will have an example of, you know, this coffee shop in my neighborhood used to be open till 10 o'clock every night and, yeah. or maybe it was open 24 hours and now they actually just can't find the people uh, to keep those restaurants open late or um, some of those little cafes that are now running restricted hours. And in my hometown, the uh, variety store used to be a variety store and a restaurant. Well, it's, it's only a variety store now because they can't find um, chefs and waitresses and waiters to, uh, to yeah. keep the business running. So profitability is tough through the system if you've got escalating costs and, you know, could they bring people in if they paid a higher wage or are the people really not there? It's hard to know the answers to some of those questions, but there are costs all the way through for sure. Energy is also very expensive. Yeah, and getting more so, which I which I understand. So. I, I think this is such a complex subject and, and often what people do like me, when something is really complex, you simplify it in order to understand it, but it might not be accurate. 
and it might not reflect the realities of what people are, are facing. But I do think this is a discussion that we have to have. The food banks of Ontario have been putting this stuff out recently about income and other things, but also about grocery prices, because there seems to be a mix match. There's some, something is wrong. Um, so we have to deal with that. But I, one of the things that I, I really wish you and I could get into at some point, and we won't do it now, but I, I would really like to know how cities, and we talked about this the last time, how cities can change their bylaws and other things to start taking advantage of the food that is around them or within them to be able to create venues by which that can get more quickly to customers, especially local food, those kinds of things. I, I think cities, you know, is, is I talk with various city folks and others, there's, there's very much an awareness that local really matters, you know, greenhouse is great, blah, 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 blah. But there seems to be an unsureness as to how to proceed with a sensitizing a city government or how a community works so that it can actually take advantage of that food that's that's more localized um, and I asked you in our last uh, our last time you know do you think that that's a real issue and you thought that it was but I, I do think that we should talk about that more because I think city politicians and bureaucrats and others are honestly looking to find that you know many cities have have agreed with the uh, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and wish to go that way. Most cities have a climate emergency action plan. But I, I sometimes wonder if, if people, the people with the real expertise to help them with that are people like yourself and others that they should go there and say, what would we have to do in order to, in order to do that? Um, I, and I know you said there is some of that happening in the province last time we spoke. But do you see a momentum coming to that or you just think it's hit and miss depending on the community and who the leaders are? I think it's a little bit hit, hit or miss, depending on the community and the community leadership. Um, you know, I've seen a resurgence, certainly in sort of Guelph and Wellington uh, for farmers markets and uh, maybe some of those pop up mar farmers markets that might serve, you know, some of what you're talking about there. There's the permanent infrastructure of, you know, a significant farmers market like St. Jacobs or um, London has one as well downtown, I think. Um, but maybe, you know, in times of uh, surplus when there's a significant amount of, you know, a particular crop or it's been a great growing season, maybe we need to to look at, can you have a pop-up market? It's just once or it's just for three weeks where we can bring in some of this food. Farmers would have access to, you know, a, a site or a location and it's just here it is and, and you can access uh, products. I think it leads a little bit back to um, what we were talking about earlier around, you know, buying too much. So, you, yeah. you could have a, a product that is readily available and, and maybe overproduced this year, um, but to buy it in bulk, someone has to have the ability to do something with it, to store it, to freeze it, to can it, um, you know, because people coming out and buying, you know, a little bag of produce at a time, yeah. um, it, it becomes quite expensive, but. Yeah. Kathy, I really appreciate this. I think we all need an education from people like you, right? I think you see the different aspects of not just the industry, but of communities. And um, But we need to have more discussions like this because I think people are aware that it has to happen. It's just what are the right ways for us to go ahead and do it? So I might circle back to you at some point. I won't over the next two weeks, I promise. But you have so much experience and I really appreciate you coming in and doing this. But I'm just saying that personally for myself, I'm really wrestling with this stuff. You know, Jane and I, we do a lot of work in South Sudan and a lot of that has been around food security and other things through women's programming and other things. And it's the same problem here. Like it's just, it's this connecting of the dots in a way that is efficient, but also productive and, and lucrative, right? So people can make a, a, a business out of it. It's, it just seems to me that we're going to need help from people like you. Thanks for doing this today, Kathy. I really appreciate it. And I will contact you again in the future. And, and we'll that sounds good. This. Yeah, I hope so. And I appreciate you educating us the way that you have. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome.